So I want to talk about social insurance and market failures and government intervention in these markets. And the first thing I want to do is to go over a little bit of the background here. Um, the second thing I'm going to do is just list a lot of market failures, reasons for that, and possible government interventions. And then I'm going to do a, one example in a little bit more detail. That's about the pension systems, pensions and retirement. And that's the three things I'm going to do. Now, the background is, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about things like um, disability insurance, for example. We're talking about unemployment insurance. We're talking about pensions. Um, we're also talking about um, sick pay. So a lot of things going into social insurance, and it makes up a big part of the government budget in a lot of different countries. Some people say also health insurance, but that's um, that's a different topic here. It's very important, um, and it's a big uh, big factor uh, in the lives of many people. Let's, let's, so let's just give one example of that. Um, let's say for pensions, maybe you have to save as much as three hundred thousand dollars for example in order to cover the cost of five years in a nursing home so in order to save three hundred thousand dollars you uh, to pay for that because that's as much as it costs maybe even more then you would have to save about seven thousand five hundred dollars a year in order to cover those costs so it's it's a big thing Okay, so let's discuss some of the market failures here. Well, first of all, um, some people say there are high transaction costs in some of these markets. High transaction costs. What does that mean? Well, let's go to uh, an insurance market and say that in order to pay for your insurance, the price of that insurance would be, say, P here is the price, for a certain person, I. That depends on the probability that they will actually have to pay out a certain amount, L, the loss. So the price depends on how much they have, the insurance company has to pay, and the probability that they have to pay that, plus the transaction cost, or actually determining whether they want you as a customer. You have to apply, and they have to go over the application, and collect information, and process the whole thing. Now, these are the transaction costs, and sometimes the transaction costs can be quite high, maybe as high as 20%, 50%, you know, between there for some, some, uh, some kinds of insurance. And health insurance and social insurance seems to have high transaction costs. And this is a market failure, not in a standard sense, but it's a market failure in the sense that the market may fail to exist if the transaction cost is very high because then people not, will not pay that. And maybe the government can provide something with a lower transaction cost doesn't have to be, but maybe. Because when the government provides it, they will just say automatically, everybody has to be included. There are no transaction costs. We're not going to evaluate whether you should be in this system or not. Everyone is included. So they can actually reduce the transaction cost by doing that. So that's one reason why you have government intervention in, in, in these markets. And almost every country in the world has some kind of government intervention in these markets. The second reason, or second market failure in this system, would be um, the failure of the private insurance to provide for uh, protection against systematic risks, systemic risk. That could be things like inflation, it could be things like um, what if there is a big recession and everyone loses a lot? If there's a big fire, a war, a natural catastrophe, things like that. Because it's assumed when you have private insurance that uh, P highs, the probability that you will actually suffer this, is we assume that these are independent usually in order to create a healthy and functioning insurance market. And if they're not independent, it's really difficult to, to create a good insurance market. And that's what we mean by, by systematic risk. That's when the probability that something bad happens are not independent. So, for example, a war, then then a lot of people will have um, bad outcomes. So that's why insurance contracts usually have, oh, this insurance contract is not valid. 
in, during war, for example. It's the same in unemployment. In, during a recession, a lot of people will need unemployment benefits. And that's why the government actually steps in and, and takes those kind of risks. So that's one reason. The third reason, you understand the reason uh, with information in information economics. Um, so you have adverse selection and have moral hazard. Now adverse selection means that the market may not work because the bad customers will be attracted to that insurance. So um, they have to increase the price because they will get a lot of bad customers. Only the people who know they need the insurance will actually seek it out. Um, and then they have to raise the price and then the market for good customers will disappear because you can't prove you're a good customer because there's information problems. This problem the government can actually solve by saying, okay, we're going to have one insurance company and they're going to have all the customers. So there's not, not a problem attracting good and bad customers. There will, there will be an average of the population. So this can be solved by government intervention in, in technical sense. Now, the moral hazard problem that's slightly different is the fact that once you have insurance, you will start to behave differently. This problem cannot be solved by uh, government intervention. So, for example, if you start to become less careful once you have insurance, then it doesn't matter if you have private insurance or government insurance, the insurance itself will make you behave worse, and that's a problem we have uh, both in the private sector and uh, in the, even if you make it a government intervention here. Now, fourth problem could be externalities. Now there's one strange kind of externality, which is, I guess you could say, we're not going to have public social insurance. And if you don't buy social insurance, then tough luck. We're not going to give you it, anything. But it's kind of difficult to, to just lay, make old people not give them pensions and not give them sick pay when they actually become sick or become old. So maybe then your children have to take care of you. So your decision not to buy a pension insurance or sick pay insurance, unemployment insurance or disability insurance will have consequences for some other people. Now they, they could choose not to do anything and say, oh tough luck, you, you made that decision. But in practice they're not going to do that. Or a lot of people are not going to do that. So it imposes some kind of externality on people. Um, and for that reason, some people say, okay, we have, to have, we have to regulate this. We have to say, it's mandatory to have this kind of insurance. So they can't impose a free rider externality on everyone else. Now, the fifth reason for market failure in the system is not a technical reason, but it's more a psychological thing. Maybe we underestimate the probability that something bad will happen, or maybe we underestimate the importance of future consequences. So if there's a systematic tendency to that, if we do that, then some people will say, maybe we should intervene and say, you have to have this. Now, there are many more reasons. You could add, for example, a trust problem. One problem with a free market or a totally free market in, in, in any way in this case, is that you're actually paying for something and you're getting something back and the time lag between these two events is very large. So you have to trust the company to actually be around to provide you from, with that pension that you actually paid. And you have to have some kind of oversight or regulation so the government actually makes sure that the insurance company will pay out. Otherwise they can just take the money and run. Um, so, so you have to have some kind of regulation in order to prevent that from happening. Okay, so these were some reasons for market failure, some of the reasons why the government intervenes, and some things they could do, and some of the problems associated with that as well. Now, let me talk a little bit more about pension systems. So, in general, there are two kinds of pension systems. First of all, you have funded systems, and then you have pay-as-you-go systems. The funded system basically you pay into a, um, it's almost like a bank. You pay your, your money into that bank and you get to withdraw the money when you retire. 
pay as you go is slightly different. You, you pay into, you basically you're paying now, but you're paying to the old people now, and you're relying on the promise that the young people tomorrow will pay for your pension when you become old. Um, now the funded system is is very predictable, in that I know exactly how much money I have. But it has some problems in terms of systematic risk, for example. What if there's suddenly a lot of inflation? And what if the... so, so, so the fund will go down? Um, what if there's a suddenly a rise in productivity? Which means that you will have quite a low pension compared to the young people um, at a certain point in time. So, so uh, but, but uh, pay-as-you-go as well has some problems and some benefits. Pay-as-you-go will protect, pre will protect you against the systematic risks of, uh, let's say, increased productivity. Um, if you think about relative, if you're concerned about having a low relative living standard to the young people, and also inflation. But um, pay-as-you-go, well, you have to rely on the promise of the government then, and some people may not want to do that. But you have two different, you know, these are two basic different systems. Funded systems, pay-as-you-go systems. Now, what I want to illustrate a little bit more in detail is a model where you can choose um, between, let's say you have age here, or time, and let's say you have dollars, money here. Okay, and let's say we have a system where you can choose to retire somewhere between 60 and then 70 and 80 60 year olds, 70 year olds, 80 year olds, 90 year olds now let's say you can choose to retire when you're uh, 60 year olds but if you, if you do that then you will get a lower pension that's how much you will get when you're 60 you retire there and that's how much you get P 60 that's the pension you get when you're 60. Let's say you retire when you're 70. Then you take the same amount of money and you split it. But you split it on fewer years because now you, you work 10 more years. So you get more money for every year. That's the pension you will get if you're 70. How much money will you get? Well, it depends on the expected living life expectancy. So let's say the life expectancy is about um, 80 years old. Now, of course, the idea is that this um, box here, the sum, the total sum you'll get if you retire when you're 60 or 70 is the same. It's just a different amount every year because when you're 70, you have to get more money every year in order to get the same amount. But when you're 60, you're going to get less less money every year, but you're going to get it for more years. Okay, so that's the theory. Then you can you, you have flexibility in terms of when you retire. Now, if this is a government scheme, some people, of course, will live longer. They will live until they're 85, and some people will live until they're 75. As long as we assume that people do not know for how long they will live, this will cancel out. Some people will live shorter, some people live longer, and the whole system will go in, in balance. But the problem is some people may actually have information about uh, their own health and their likelihood of dying. So if you know that you're going to die early. Let's say you know you're going to die when you, or you not for sure, but you, you think it's likely that you're going to die early, when before 70 year olds. Then of course you're going to retire early. But if you know you're going to live for a long time, you're likely to live until you're 90 or 100, then you're going to retire late. So in this system, it is possible to um, adjust your behavior so that you can actually get more from the system. And this could cause a, a cost problem um, if people actually behave strategically in this way. At least if, uh, it, it will cause a cost problem if the people who designed the system did not account for this kind of strategic behavior. So this shows one of the problems with uh, the optimal regulation of, of the market in, in this sense. And that's it. Thanks.